So the book we're going to be going over today and then I'm going to move on to chess.com and we'll do some puzzles together is I Beat Fisher's Record by Judith Polgar and uh, I actually also have a hard copy which is here. And uh, this is such a great book and I just love and admire Judith Polgar so much. I'm sure many people do. She is such an icon of chess and such a hero to so many girls. And just um, her playing style is so inspiring and just everything about her. Okay, I'm a big fan, obviously. Everything about her is just super inspiring. So, uh, as I mentioned, it's a three series book. So the, we're going to check out the first one today. I think uh, this is pretty accessible. And, uh, you know, the games are not so complicated yet that um, it's so difficult to understand. So I think... Uh, for players of many levels, almost, I think all levels, this book, like I think like 1,000, 1,200, 1,400 plus, should be very enjoyable. And she has a lot of book games from her youth. So when she was a kid, from some scholastic tournaments, from some youth tournaments. And, you know, she goes back and she talks about um, her games and uh, some of her memories. So the first chapter in her book is uh, Tricks. And, okay, I have my video kind of big, so we can cover the answers. And... Uh, so she says, when an adult loses to a very young player, the most common excuse he comes up with is he or she tricked me. Uh, so she says, the cliche is that the baby opponent somehow undeservably managed to change the logical course of the game in a radical way. Um, so she said like she she's a, she called herself a tricky player and she says that um, um, she said, okay so I'll just read it I see the trick is basically simple but the very well mass tactical operation it requires imagination alertness lack of preconceptions and the ability to intuitively perceive the intimate dynamic nuances of the position okay that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> Pretty uh, big definition of um, of tricks. Uh, it says, okay, so it says, I must confess that whenever I examine a position, my train of thought tends to go in a tactical direction. Not surprisingly, many times I have planned tricks well in advance, but I tend to look uh, as innocent as possible in order to avoid giving a hint to my opponent. So a bit of a poker face or maybe... Um, like reverse psychology kind of thing. Well, not reverse psychology, but you know, act, like, okay, acting innocent, however you want to call that. All right, so white plays rook f2, question mark. So in a simplified position, so I think he just, he was low on time, he didn't want to try his luck, so he probably thought I'm just going to simplify everything and it's going to end in a draw. But even in simple positions, you know, there's always tactics or something to be looking out for. So what to do? The black to move. Share your thoughts in the chat. So there's not a lot of moves here. Obviously, if you take... Well, I didn't mean to do that. Then I take... There isn't much to play for here, right? We exchange everything and... We're kind of running our um, material. Hey guys, thanks everyone who's joining me. If you're just joining, we are looking through Judith Polgar's book. In Forward Chess app, like I just, uh, if you're just joining, you didn't hear my 10 minute speech about how much I love Judith and you know how much she means to me as a chess player and a woman chess player. So I highly, highly recommend this book. Like, it's also here, it's here, like she's everywhere for me. <laughs> and uh, so if you don't have this book, um, uh, I highly recommend you get it. It's both entertaining, it's her life, it's uh, educational, it's like everything in one book. Uh, I haven't look, uh, read it from cover to cover, I've just kind of been working through it, but everything I've seen, maybe I'm biased, <laughs> but everything I've seen has been really, really good. So yeah, you guys are right. So Rook H2, and this is a very unpleasant <laughs> move to face, when, especially when you think the game is over, and this is when you, she says, right? Like when you're... Um, in time trouble and you lose your concentration and when you think the game is about to end is when you lose your concentration because you think it's over and done with. Yes, and then of course you cannot take. 
because he takes f2 and now you're threatening both the knight and f1 queen and the game is over. It says uh, the unfortunate position of the knight is the decisive factor as white cannot prevent f1 queen f, f takes e1 queen. She said I always enjoy when I can do something unusual which turns out to be good. And then if we go here, of course, if you go back, once again, I um, I checked and now it's a double check. So I'm going to get your horse. Oh, sorry. And then if you go back, I have a very simple way of winning here. I can simply check. I can check. And my king will just take all the pawns and it'll be checkmate very soon. All right. Very good. Uh, Alright, let's check out the next one. The next one is quite difficult. So this one... Uh, wait, Dr. Renan. So what is this? 1984. This was actually before I was born. <laughs> I will now show a typical case of objective details related to uh, strictly to the position, which allowed me to carry out a simple but quite nice tactical operation. Alright, so this one is black to move. So this one is actually pretty difficult. So let's check out this knight e4. It may seem that white has some attacking chances, I'm reading her notes, in view of the weakened black king side, but this poor coordination is a... but his poor coordination... Oh my god, his, but his poor coordination is the deciding feature. The f2 rook is pinned, which creates back rank problems, while his b3 knight does not take part in the fight. So the b3 knight is on the wrong side of the board. These factors gave me the possibility to get an advantage with a slightly paradoxical move. Knight e4, very nice. Attacking the pinned rook and the overloaded c3 knight, which is tasked with, uh, with keeping the back rank defended. My opponent did not suspect that I might even consider allowing his next move. Uh, and then uh, he she gives a line with rook d8. Rook d8. And if you guys haven't seen, so maybe you can tell me the move here. Black to move. I think a lot of people should be able to find it because my chat is very strong. Very nice. Very nice. Rook d1 and the horsey is overworked. Covering this and this and the rook cannot block. Alright. But in the game her opponent plays queen f7. And now knight d5. And she says what else? So she takes, takes, and she says eventually she won with her ad material advantage. And here it's not that hard because the rook is just gonna take everything. Uh, so another amazing game by Judith from this one was from 1984, right? So very, very long time ago. Okay. So basically on the left, uh, this is the book, you have your board, uh, we can make things, you know, if you just want to read the book, you can go like this, if you're just solving, you can make the whole thing, uh, the board, and you can solve it and come back. So it's very easy to use, and it's um, very useful. I've been solving a lot of puzzles uh, on this app lately, I've been using Romain Edwards book. And uh, it's very easy if you're teaching because you can send to clipboard. So if you're using chess.com to teach a group of students or something like that. Or if you're using, um, you know, you have one-on-one -on -one lessons and you're sharing a board, which is very easy to do on chess.com. You can just copy your positions there, which is super easy. So I enjoy that part quite a bit. Okay, let me see if my video is going to come back. Oh, look at that. Okay, so I'm going to go like this, so you, when we look at puzzles, you don't see answers. Let me make my board a little bit bigger. You can change the color of your board. Mine is green because I like green. Alright, so now there's a photo of her from uh, her youth day. She says the way I prepared back then. 
Oh yeah, this one is a very good one. So she says things had not gone the way I wanted so far. I had played the Bank of Gambit, my main weapon against D4 at that time, but I failed to get the desired compensation. So basically she sacrificed the pawn and then ended up down the pawn. White is up a pawn, has centralized position and safer king in many endings. And the presence of an outside pass pawn could be the decisive factor. And she says, um, White's ability in the center is not absolute. The knight is attacked by the bishop and knight defended by, not defended by a pawn. Moreover, it breaks the communication between the queen and the rook. While looking for pl practical chances, I found a hidden trick. So she goes queen c7. And she says she seems to release the pressure against d4, which makes my opponent's lack, uh, my opponent's lack of alertness excusable, especially as he was in time trouble. He may have thought uh, that I planned to uh, activate my queen with queen c3 and correctly evaluated it after his answer. I would have no time for that. So he went h4. So what was Judith's great trick in this position? <coughs> so h4. So what is Judith's great idea again? So she gives h4 a question mark. Let's look at his white claw. Alright guys, black to move. What do we think? What was Judith Pol Polgar's great idea here? Uh, so bishop d4, yeah, I mean I can take with queen d4. My back rank is actually not weak. And after, so I don't think you want to trade this bishop with this knight. Because after I take on d4, it's a double attack both on uh, b2 and d7. It's a very, very pretty move. So I want to see if anyone's going to be able to find it. So I will give guys some minutes to think about it. Ooh, someone in chess.com found it. Very nice. What is it? Made Nishin? Oh my god. But don't go to chess.com and like look in the chat and uh, <laughs> see what the answer was. <laughs> Try to figure it out on your own. No, 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 no. So you are like, you know, she went queen c7 for a reason. So we're not just playing queen c7 to play queen c7. So she had a trick in mind. So you are looking for tactics. Remember what she mentioned? She mentioned the knight on d4 is kind of under attack. It's not defended by a pawn. Because that's the best way to defend the piece, right? With a pawn. So then it's like really defended. So black to move. Ooh. People people are having ideas. Yeah, rook d2 is a pretty tricky move. And uh, it really breaks the coordination for white, right? And again, this is one of those moves your opponent plays and you're like, oh god. Like, what did I do? And you know, that cold shower feeling that you get when everything's going well and then your opponent plays a move out of nowhere and you just feel like, ugh. Uh, so rook d2 was played, exclaim, my opponent realized immediately that something serious had happened, unfortunately his promising position had already turned into the last one. Blank wins the knight and after a few defensive moves the game. So looking for practical chances, so uh, obviously this does not help because, okay she also gives it in the book. And uh, the horse is lost because of the pin. So if you go something like this. Um, doesn't quite help because bishop e5 and b8 is covered. Okay, instead rook e1 was played. She took queen f7. 
She said, I assume I assume that White played only on oh my god. I assume that White played on partly because he was short of, of time, but mainly because he was in shock. The threat of Rookie 7 is strong, but the White King is exposed now, and I have simple ways of counterattacking. So she just grabs a pawn. So obviously there is no Rookie 7 because mate. Because <laughs> the Rook on H4 is uh, doing a very good job. So instead G3 was played, Rook E4, and Queen C2. And I think her opponent is no. Yeah, Queen D7, Queen B3 was played, and I think uh, her opponent resigned, and she gives this line with. And says white is just one tempo too slow. And I have to mention the queen going to e5 also defends, so. Uh, Alright. Oh, this is a very adorable picture of her and Sophia. Yeah, and, uh, so she says, uh, you guys can see it, right? So Sophia and I in front of the wall with 30 positions for our homework. So of course they had a very strict regimen of um, studying and I think uh, like she had those cards with positions too, right? Like thousands of them that she had to solve. So obviously her parents dedicated uh, a lot of time to training uh, the sisters. Uh... Oh man, this is, this is the first sentence. The game of chess was initially intended as an imitation of then a highly popular method of, method of social interaction or... For medieval people, the final aim of a chess player, the mate, must have looked rather natural. Indeed, any war would come to a sudden end if the king was captured or killed, no matter how things had been developing before and how many human losses the belligerent side had suffered. Oh man, it's kind of heavy. Um, so I have to say, I, I find that for beginners, the concept of checkmate is kind of foreign. I mean, the, it's um, difficult. Uh, because it does feel, when you're teaching someone how to play chess, especially a little kid, and then you start to teach them uh, like how the pieces move and like capturing, right? Yeah, that's pretty bleak. Capturing and like, you know, you want to capture your opponent's pieces and then you introduce the king and then all of a sudden it's like, okay, forget all of that. So the way you actually win the game is by checkmating your opponent and then you have to explain checkmate and then uh, it becomes kind of difficult. Uh, so for some uh, for some kids, uh, I feel like it's a difficult part, and I do feel like it's just uh, it's kind of feels like almost like an unnatural thing, right? The way the chess game ends with a checkmate, it feels like capturing your opponent's king should be the way. Very controversial statement, but I, I do feel like from kids' point of view, they just don't understand, and and for them, like stalemate is how you win the game, because they're like my opponent's king cannot move, like I win the game, and it's like so hard to explain, but like you didn't check the king, you know, it's like in a word. Anyways, uh, so this is a game of her and her sister playing blindfolded. <laughs> Despite the limited mobility compared with other pieces, the king frequently gives the impression of a slippery fish escaping through your fingers. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think it's that. that. I think uh, I think it's their coach. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't think it's the father. I, I like comparing the chess uh, the chess king to uh, to a slippery fish. She said, I once heard of a very strong player say that winning material is a safer method than playing for a mate, because the latter may well prove illusory. <laughs> now, there's one example that I really... Oh, okay, like this one I really like. So this is already... She's playing against uh, Lars Hansen, so... Uh, uh, maybe you guys have seen this, so she says this is a position with mutual attacks in which both sides have revealed advanced stages of their aggressive operation. So the position is pretty crazy, right? Um, well, this is going to be white to move. Sorry guys, I didn't flip it. <laughs> so Judith is playing white, so we're always looking from winner side, right? And we all just assume winner uh, Judith is always winning. I think she has a couple of games where she lost that she included here. 
All right, so basically she says they're both attacking. They don't have a lot of time, blah, blah, blah. She t and, uh... Yeah, if it was blocked to move, this would not be a very happy game. So she plays King H4. She says, and apparently innocuous, I think I pronounced that correctly, as if I'm closing my eyes and running due to the fear of the check on G2, without really being able to prevent the capture. Um. Uh, sorry. Oh my god, I lost my place. In fact, my far from obvious intention was to take the G5 square under control in order to create the threat of mate. Can you see the idea? And she says, my opponent failed to understand my true intentions and may have thought that capturing on G2 would just lead to some transposition. Instead of failing into my trap, he could have forced a draw in many ways. So yeah, maybe this, this I think might be a little... Um, a famous example, but I think it's just such a great one uh, because and this kind of goes with uh, the last one, right? The um, tricks and mating that. So she's a very tricky player, but the way you know she describes tricks, it says like tricks complement your game. You're not just playing hope chess, but you are just basically uh, utilizing the resources in the position. So if there's a resource in a position that offers something, like if there's king h4 a resource in a position and you play it and your opponent falls for it, then it's not really a trick, right? It's just like asking your opponent the question, like, what are you going to do now? So, of course, rook 4 had to be played. Instead, they played queen g2, so you guys are right. Um, um, uh, queen g7 and queen h7 are the same move. <laughs> she said, my opponent's face turned red instantly. After a few moments of double-checking the gravity of the situation, he resigned. There was no need to go for the whole line, but I, I feel like if you blunder this, you should play it, right? You should give your opponent the pleasure of checkmating you once. Uh. But I guess if you blunder this, you just don't want to play it out because it just feels so bad. So actually today one of my students asked me like, why don't like players play it out? Like, is it like insulting? Like if they played it out, would it be insulting to their opponent because I was showing them the game between um, Magnus and Firuja but uh, you know like grandmasters I mean there is a respect part right you don't want to play out like in a completely lost position but I think allowing some checkmates on the board is very nice uh, obviously not pleasant but but easier to do in an online game because it's easier to like, get checkmated online it's not as personal rant over and then she does add, of course, queen h7 would have won the same way. She said, foreseeing the combination was less easy for black, especially under time pressure. First of all, it did not uh, work one move earlier. Secondly, he may have uh, simply overlooked the possibility of the queen sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, because sometimes you just don't see it, right? Um, so yeah, so this is Judith's book. Of course, there's a lot of other chapters. Um, there's memorable games and uh, you know different ways so you can choose how you want to go through this book i don't think you have to go in order that she presents it it's whatever you're in the mood for if you're a teacher uh you know you can like a lead in development is a pretty nice t chapter to teach to your students uh oh wow so we open it to standing next to f oh my god why can i read standing next to the large filing system my parents made so we could prepare it specifically for our opponents or work generally on our openings. Of course, nowadays we have many millions of games on a laptop. Exclamation uh, mark. So, so there's a lot of chapters to go through in, in this book. And, you know, I cannot praise this book enough. I do adore Judith so much. <laughs> I just love I just love her style so much. I actually was very lucky because she did a master class on... Um, on the Sicilian at the Charlotte Chess Center and I attended and it was so awesome to be, you know, to be lectured by Judith. It was just really amazing. She was showing some of her games and she was just so open to like people were giving suggestions even when they're wrong. She was like so nice about it. She wasn't just like, oh my god, what are these moves? So it was just so great. <laughs> so this is my uh, 
me expressing my adoration for Judith. And of course, she's also a great commentator. Anyways, uh, so guys, check this book out. Uh, so of there's three um, volumes. Yeah, she's a great commentator. So there's three volumes. So there's volume one, two, and three. So this is the first one, and uh, all three are available at the store. So if we search for it. Uh, so thanks guys for hanging out and once again make sure you are checking out forward chess buy some books um yes this was very positional chess buy some books use the code you know there's no reason for you guys to not get a discount when shopping for books they have a great collection so it's super easy to use like what i use is what you see you can use it on the web you can use it on your iPad if you're like traveling, if you're going to work by train, which none of this is happening right now. But you know, if you're commuting or if you're just hanging out, you don't want to be on your computer, you can check it out on your phone or something. It's very, like the layout is really nice and very easy to use, especially if you're using puzzles, you know, you just kind of can uh, uh, um, maximize your screen, uh, your uh, board and then just scroll through them. Or the other way, you can minimize your port and you can just uh, scroll through the puzzles. So there's a very big library for you guys to go through. Thanks for the follows. Thanks everyone who comes and hangs out, hangs out with me. I really appreciate it. So they have a huge store of any kind, all kinds of books. I will, um, I will write a blog post for book recommendations. So thanks everyone for hanging out and hopefully see you soon. Have a great night.